right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Pentecost Sunday. Look at all you in red. Most, most of us in red. Good job. Good job. I like it. Yes, this is the uh, day we celebrate the birth of the church, the coming of the Holy Spirit upon the uh, first congregation there in Jerusalem. And uh, we'll talk more about that later. So that's a little preview for you. It is the last sermon in our sermon series about the building blocks of faith. And here we go. We're going to be post-Pentecost starting next week. Um, we'll have some announcements later on in the service and talk about a few things, but our liturgist today is Doug Crook, so I'll invite Doug to come forward to kick us off with some gathering words. <coughs> At this time, we'll open up the floor for the sharing of joys and concerns. If you have either one of those, please raise your hand, and Lisa will come around with the microphone. Once you have the mic, just uh, state your name and then share whatever you're comfortable sharing. Kathy Bostrom, and I'd like your prayers for Jim Bostrom. Uh, I have been told that he's probably on his last days, so thank you for that. Definitely pray for you and Jim. Thank you. I'm Susan, so I have prayers for our oldest grandchild, Tyndall. He is on a week-long backpack trip in the Sierras, so Ooh. hopefully he doesn't get any flooding and snow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Wow, sounds like a great trip, though. We got a kitten yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Little Siamese cat named Bucky. And we'll probably bring him next week. <laughs> Introduce you to him, I suppose. Uh, and also, we'd ask that you continue to pray for Chris. You'll notice Chris isn't here today. She's helping out her daughter and uh, her daughter's husband, her son-in-law. As he's, if you remember, we uh, talked about last week, uh, he was in a pretty bad bicycling accident and is home and recovering, but uh, Chris is there to help out with 
kids and whatever else, food and cleaning. So just continue to pray for uh, their time right now as they're working through injury. And thank you so much, Beth, for filling in on short notice. Appreciate that. All right, if you would please join me in a pastoral prayer and then all together for a version of the Lord's Prayer. <coughs> God, we come before you again so grateful for a community of faith, um, a body of believers where we can join together, learn, celebrate, share uh, our joys and our concerns with each other. Um, it is truly a, a gift for us all when we're facing hard times and also when we're sharing in joys, uh, and lifting each other up and encouraging each other. It's truly a gift. We're thankful for the birth of the church that we celebrate today. And, and uh, Lord, uh, um, all, of the, uh, all of the support that we uh, enjoy, uh, especially when we get it right, <laughs> God, we sure are grateful. Lord, we do lift up to you these uh, concerns and these joys. We do pray for Jim. We pray for his journey right now, these, uh, the, the, this, uh, these maybe last steps that he's taking here. Um, God, we lift him up to you. We pray for strength for him, for endurance, for wisdom and courage. And of course, also for Kathy, we pray for comfort and uh, just uh, knowledge of your presence, knowing that you're there with them both <coughs> um, to walk through this time. Uh, together. And Lord, we just, anything at all that we can do as well, um, give us the, the wherewithal, the vision, the, um, the ability to help support in any ways that we can. God, we're thankful for the trip that Susan's uh, uh, grandchild, his uh, grandson is going to be participating in. Um, we do pray for safety. We do pray for a safe return. But also we pray for um, just an openness, an openness to awe and wonder and to see your handiwork and um, to experience the gratitude of uh, seeing such beauty and such wonder. And God, we just lift that whole experience up to you. And God, we're thankful for kittens and uh, we're thankful for the companionship that uh, our pets can provide and we're just grateful for the gift that we have of our new little kitten and uh, we just pray for uh, the relationships to develop between the other pets, that it'd, be, uh, <laughs> that it'd be safe and healthy. And God, we also continue to pray for Chris. And uh, we're thankful that Chris was able to go up there to be with her family, to support her daughter um, and her son-in-law during this time. We just pray for healing and wholeness for, that, for uh, her son-in-law and for the whole family. Um, God, just be with them. Lord, I'm sure there's lots of other things we either didn't want to share for whatever reason or perhaps that I've forgotten. You know, I forgot to check the comment stream and mention that, but God, we uh, lift all of those up to you and you know exactly where each and every one of us are and what's going on in our lives, the burdens we carry and the joys we've experienced. So we lift all that up to you now and we thank you, God, for being faithful to us even when we wander and, and stray and, and uh, experience fear and doubt and all those other things. And now, God, we come together as one voice to offer up a version of the prayer you taught us to pray, saying, God, lover of us all, most holy one, help us to respond to you, to create what you want for us here on earth. Give us today enough for our needs. Forgive our weak and deliberate offenses, just as we must forgive others when they hurt us. Help us to resist evil and to do what is good, for we are yours, endowed with your power to make our world whole. Amen. And now Doug will come forward for the uh, scripture reading today. And my apologies to Doug. I meant to bring a, uh, a cheat sheet with uh, pronunciations. So that there's a series of some tough names. Uh, I bet you'll do awesome. <laughs> no pressure. Today's scripture reading is from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit 
and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others mocking said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The, sh the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Feel the presence. 
presence of the Lord. Sweet Holy Spirit, sweet heavenly dove, stay right here with us, filling us with We have been revived when we shall leave this place. All right. Better bring my notes with me. All right. I debated whether to do this, and, and then Rick singing made me think maybe I better not. But all right, I'll do it. Ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear church. Happy birthday to you. Yay! Happy birthday! <laughs> yes, that's right. Pentecost Sunday, that's uh, where we are. So we're at the end of our Easter season, and we are, this is the last sermon in that series. We're, we've been talking about the building blocks of faith, what it means to kind of follow Christ after this resurrection. You know, what does it mean to have faith now that Christ is gone, but the Holy Spirit's here? What are we to look like? What are we to be like? We talked about the importance of going ahead and being comfortable with some doubt and uncertainty, right? The disciples were uncertain about what was going to happen, what will happen next, what's going to go on. Uh, everything we thought we were so sure about, whoosh, wow, God sure surprised us. And that's okay. That's a part of faith. That's where we should be. We should understand that we're talking about God, and so we're never going to have it all figured out and nailed down. And if we ever think we've got it figured out and all nailed down, then boy, are we in trouble because God always has more surprises. That's today. Today is all about more surprises. And we talked about the importance of a community, having a, a, a fellowship, a body that supports each other and encourages each other. We talked about the importance of looking like Jesus, you know, living our, matching our lives, molding ourselves into the image of Christ, being Jesus to the world around us. And that also led us to talk about sharing our faith. Today we're going to talk about being moved even in times of anxiety and fear and uncertainty, still moving and being moved by the Holy Spirit. And if we're talking about Pentecost, you know what I'm going to talk about next. You know I'm going to talk about Holy Spirit holes, right? <laughs> you were about to nod your head yes, but do you even know what I'm talking about, Holy Spirit holes? No? Okay, that's okay. You're forgiven because I just learned about these things this week. And they've been around for thousands of years, so let me explain. So think about back in history, there was a time we call pejoratively the Dark Ages, you know, because, oh, they were so unknowledgeable back then. Oh, it was, uh, life was so dark. We were, they were unenlightened back then compared to us now, you know, living in the enlightenment, post-enlightenment period. But that's what we, we sometimes call it that, or the Middle Ages, medieval times. And it was, in fact, you know, it was a bleak time. I mean, just to be completely honest with you, there was a lot going on in the world at that time that it was hard. It was a struggle. I heard one historian comparing that time to, you know, if you wanted to get even just a small sense of what it was like during this period of time. Think about if you can uh, remember the Great Depression or if you heard stories about the Great Depression. Now lengthen that out over 600 years, a 600-year Great Depression. And then you start to get a picture of what it was like. So Rome had been sacked and taken down and, and destroyed, thank goodness, but it left this great, incredible vacuum where before food had been provided, food was available, but now it was scarce. People had to scrape to get by. Um, disease was rampant. Of course, we know about uh, the plague, you know, the great plague, the bubonic plague, and other various 
diseases and maladies that led to just a shortened, very short life expectancy during this time. It was tough. It was hard. It was bleak. There were some bright spots, though, and one of the bright spots, if you can believe it, actually was the local cathedrals in these towns. These cathedrals, even in the smallest of towns, they would have these cathedrals, some grand and beautiful. There was actually, I know we look at them now and we think about waste of money, waste of resources, but actually those cathedrals provided a a lot for (laughs) the population. It was a place where they could gather together, aside from just worshiping together, but just to gather together. It was a center of life, of social life, spiritual life, obviously cultural life. They would actually, those cathedrals, if you're thinking about depression, these cathedrals actually provided a lot of public employment because they would, they would have ongoing public works centered around the cathedral so people actually had jobs and could get paid. And the types of jobs they were doing led to cultural beautification. Some of the world's greatest art ever was produced during this incredibly dark trying suf- of suffering and a, m- a lot of it was centered around the cathedrals and the churches, providing a little bit of light and beauty in a time of crushing suffering and disease. And so in these so-called dark ages, some of the most beautiful murals, sculptures, stained glass windows were created. Uh, And even during this time of illiteracy, people could learn the stories and hear stories during this time. So Pentecost was actually one of the biggest celebrations of the year for these early churches during this time. Actually, it was like back then, I mean, nowadays we, I have to remind you for weeks that it's even coming, you know, kind of a thing. Like, just please, at least wear red. Please just do that, you know? But back then, it was the keystone celebration bigger than all the other holidays, if you can believe that, that the church would celebrate together. And it provided for a moment in the middle of all of this crushing uh, weight of suffering, a moment of celebration, a moment of, of radiant, just enjoying being together and celebrating something big and grand. And so what they would do, actually, these cathedrals, a lot of them were actually built with Pentecost that particular day in mind. And here's what I mean. These, a lot of these cr- cathedrals had these great domed, cathe- you know, uh, uh, vaulted ceilings that were intricately painted and decorated. They looked like the sky and clouds and lots of beautiful things going on there. And in those ceilings were hidden trap doors. Yeah. Somebody's really interested. Yeah, thank you. Keep me going. We don't amen here, but I love hearing the, huh, yeah, that sounds cool. So yes, trap doors in the ceilings, and the reason they they were used specifically for Pentecost, because what would happen? During worship, some of the members of the congregation would sneak up into the roof, into the ceiling, and at an appointed time, they would open up the trap doors, and out of those trap doors would come what do you think? That's right, Lot. You've heard this already. <laughs> you are too. Oh, did you leave before the sermon? Ah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, live doves would be released out of these trap doors and uh, through the painted skies and the clouds on the ceiling, these doves would descend and they'd come swooping down over the congregation. And at that moment, at that moment, these symbols of the, the Holy Spirit, the living and moving Holy Spirit would come down, and at that same moment, the choir would be instructed to start making noise, and they would, they'd clap their hands, and they'd pound their, and they'd clash some things together, and they'd whoosh, whoosh you know, like that. I'm being honest, this is not me making this, they'd really do all this to represent this time, this noise of this craziness, these drum beats, and there's these Drum beats began to soar and the whooshing would get louder. They would open the trap doors again and this time they would drop rose petals through the trap door out all over the congregation to represent flame, uh, tongues of fire falling down on the congregation. And so if you can imagine these holes through which the, the doves swooped and the rose petals came down, these were called Holy Spirit holes. That's what they were referred to. 
And if you can just picture in the midst of a hard, hard, hard existence of working day in, day out, just to eke out barely surviving, you can only imagine that this sort of moment, extravagant beauty, felt like, seemed like a miracle for them in the moment. A reminder that when God is in the church and we are letting it happen, something surprising, beautiful, wonderfully unexpected happens. So, back to the original Pentecost. After Jesus has ascended into heaven, 120 men and women gathered together in one place. They had been instructed to wait, to stay in Jerusalem until they were clothed with power from on high. That's how they were instructed, to wait for that to happen. So, you can imagine, that's not the most specific <laughs> instruction. That's pretty vague. Just wait until you feel some power coming from on high. Just wait until that happens. So stay they did, and wait they did, in an upper room, door closed, shutters locked and drawn, out of fear and anxiety, and just, we don't even know what to do or what to expect next. And after a while, you can imagine, things get a little stuffy, Group, the group gets restless. And here's how I know that these disciples would make great United Methodist people today. Because their first thing is, you know what we should do while we're waiting is, um, let's make a committee, okay? Let's, let's call together a nominations committee because there's only 11 of us and I'm pretty sure the Book of Discipline says there's supposed to be 12 of us. So, Let's call together a nominations committee and uh, nominate a new person, and Matthias gets nominated. And by the way, this is the last time you ever hear <laughs> of poor Matthias. He's brought up here, and we know nothing more about him. Maybe he didn't do so great. Who knows? But they're there wondering, what's our purpose? What are we supposed to do? What's next? Who are we now that Jesus is gone? Followers without a leader. Disciples without a teacher. A congregation that isn't quite yet a church. So they wait some more. <laughs> you know, it's like that Dr. Seuss, um, Oh, the Places You Will Go book, The Waiting Place, where everybody's just waiting, waiting for the train to come or a bus to go, waiting for the sun to shine or the wind to blow, waiting around for a yes or a no. Everybody's just waiting. That's what they're doing. They're in the waiting place. Thousands of faithful people, though, start streaming into the city as they're sitting there waiting. These Jewish folks who are spread all out over the Greco-Roman Empire, um, spread, we would call them probably a diaspora, you know, spread out all throughout the Roman Empire. They come to Jerusalem. 50 days after Passover, huh? 50 days, Pentecost, isn't that neat how that all works out? 50 days. And they're coming together for this feast, this specific feast, the Feast of Booths, we sometimes call it, the Feast of Tents, the Shavuot, where they gather together and they build tents and they live in tents for a few days, waiting around the city as a commemoration of God delivering the words of life to Moses on Mount Sinai, where they built tents around Mount Sinai and they waited, were waiting for God to speak. And all of a sudden, God does in a cloud of rushing fire and wind and storm. Eh? Kind of amazing, the parallels here. And, God, and these people come together into Jerusalem, and they're gathering as faithful people to commemorate this moment. And from the windows of their room, you can just picture or imagine these disciples. They can hear all these people coming into the city, and they can start hearing them speak in all of their different languages. Languages of their homes, wherever they're from, their foreign lands all spread across the Greco-Roman world as they come to celebrate and bring their first fruits of the harvest to offer to God to these uh, uh, in Jerusalem. And you can imagine them hearing the temple priests beginning to read or uh, sing the scriptures about this time at Mount Sinai with the commandments giving and the rushing wind and the fire. But there they are just waiting. They didn't leave. They didn't move. They didn't know what to do. They didn't talk to anyone else. 
It didn't even open the door because maybe it just felt safer to stay put. But just when these gathered disciples were probably reaching the point of boredom, because can you imagine being in the same room with the same 11 people? I love every one of you here, but if I were stuck in a room with 11 of you for weeks on end, I would probably want to see something new, you know, after a while, and vice versa. Cody, we love you, <laughs> but uh, two weeks together in this place. May, could you go over to that corner over there for a while, you know, kind of thing? And then all of a sudden, God shows up. God was already there, but I mean, now all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit descends, rushing into this place. You can, you can almost just visually picture it like, Doors banging open, shutters clanging open, this rushing wind and the fire coming down and, and uh, 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 eyes wide, the disciples, they don't even know what to say. Maybe they're frightened and then all of a sudden it says that they burst out and they begin to speak and they share their stories with whoever will listen because there's tons, there's thousands of people gathered around and we're told that uh, of these people, a lot of, uh, a lot of people were moved by what in the world is going on. These guys are out here yelling and screaming. I don't know if they were yelling and screaming, but they're talking. They're talking about all this crazy stuff. And they're speaking in my language. I'm hearing them in my language. And these, I know these, these people are Galileans. You, sh you need to catch that they know they're Galileans because that means they think they're stupid. Really, that's really what they're, they're, they're not educated. We know they're from the, the country, sticks. They don't know my language. What in the world is happening here? And we're not told. We get no clue about what they were saying in these languages. But we know that thousands of people begin to flock together to hear what these fiery preachers are saying, and each of them understanding the sermons perfectly. And then Peter steps forward as these people are like, what is happening? Are they drunk? They've got to be drunk. Wh what is happening here? So standing up, Peter moves up to them and says, let me explain. He, these people, they are not filled with spirits. They are filled with the Spirit. You know the Scripture, just like Joel told us about. This is what's happening right now. This is the Spirit that is drawing us together. It has come to all of us, Peter says, the young and the old, the women and the men, the powerful and the oppressed. In every language of the world, God's Spirit is speaking. And here we are from different places, from different lives. We All of us are different, uh, got different things going on. We can't even understand each other half the time. And yet we're drawn together by the Spirit. And it will not, the Spirit will not let us stay. Where we are, who we are, it wants us to be moved. Before the day was over, the church, we're told, had grown from 120 people to 3,000, and it wasn't because of Peter's sermon. You know, as nice as sermons are, and as much credit as we preachers like to take for beautiful sermons when we do every now and then have a good one, we sure like to pat ourselves on the back for them, but I tell you what, not, it had nothing to do with Peter's sermon. And it almost never has anything to do with the sermon. And it wasn't because the disciples had come up with some catchy, flashy ad campaign or marketing ploy. It was because when they spoke, when they opened their mouths, they sounded like Jesus. When they greeted people from all over the world and welcomed them in, they were welcoming them like Jesus. When children cried, we're told later on in Acts chapter 2 and beyond, when the church started to grow and started to be the church, they would do things like when children needed help and were crying, they helped them and let them sit on their laps like Jesus. When the sick came near them, people who would not ever be touched by anyone else, they touched them and welcomed them in like Jesus. They began doing things that they never thought they would ever be able to do. Things that they only saw Jesus do in the past. But in this moment, they are so filled with new breath. That's literally the spirit is like a new wind, a new breath. Pneuma in Greek, ruah in Hebrew, same word for wind, breath, air, and spirit. They're filled with this new breath that gives them new life. 
and they can do things, and they can be the type of people in the world who represent God's love and grace and mercy and acceptance and welcome and healing. The Spirit does that in them. It's like they're born again. Not in one body this time, but in a body of believers that we call the church, this new breath of life. And they are moved, moved to do incredible things. They've, they're being transformed despite all their differences, despite the language barriers, despite their diversity, or maybe because of all those things. They're brought together and presented as a whole, complete body of Christ doing incredible things in the world. Now, for me, this is the true miracle of Pentecost, that God sees a group of people as full of anxiety and fear and doubt and prejudice, because you know they were. We all are. And yet God sees them and says, you know what? I can do something and change the world with these people. That's the miracle, that they would breathe in this new life, new inspiration, new hope, and then move into the world in new ways. That God would knock down the doors and the walls of fear and invade them so thoroughly they had no choice but to move into the world and to speak like Jesus and act like Jesus and be grace like Jesus, to share the good news. Only God could look at this people huddled in this room of fear and say, yep, I'm going to change the world with them. And you know what I said last week? What God did then, God does today too. I believe that God still does this today. I believe that God does not always wait patiently for us to put it on our calendar. You know, hey God, yes, I will be moved by the Spirit on June 18th at 1130 because I got a great window right there, God. That's a good time right there. That will be when it happens. And we'll just pencil it in. I don't think God politely waits for that when we're ready to do something new. No, I think that God invites us every day to do something new, to breathe in this life, new life, this spirit. I believe that God sometimes just crashes right in and says, now's the time. I think you're ready, even though you're afraid, even though you have doubts. And I believe that God breathes new life, life into us even in those moments and that God delights in our differences. Even though we let them separate us, God loves them and uses that to somehow bring us together when we get it right and transforms us from theys into uses. You know? I believe that God created the church on that first Pentecost and that God continues to create and recreate and inspire and re-inspire and breathe new life into the church even now. I told you last week, right? We're in a time of a lot of change and a lot of transformation, and it can be scary, and it can have doubt, leave us having doubts, and we can be worried, and we can have anxiety, and even in the middle of that, God can breathe life into us. And so that in the church that God is creating, every language is spoken. In the church that God creates, every human is loved. In the church that God is creating, everyone is valued and given a seat at the table. This is what a spirit-led church can create and can be. Not to gather behind our locked doors and shuttered windows, keeping the theys out, but instead bursting out with love and grace and truth and embracing all of the world to do the things that Jesus did, to unleash the wonder and beauty that we experience sometimes. I mean, look at this. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't this amazing? Doesn't it make you think about what the Holy Spirit can do? Good. Now go take it out there to everyone else. Thank you for doing this, by the way. Every life we meet, every person we come into, 
is an opportunity for us to be Holy Spirit holes, trap doors that burst open with the Holy Spirit, sharing it with others. It's not meant to be hoarded and held back. It's meant to be shared with everybody. And that is what changed the world back then and what God does then, God did then, God does today too. We can be the trap doors that the Holy Spirit enters the world through and we can be surprised and we can be amazed and we can be transformed. We just have to say, all right, yes, even though I'm not ready, let's do it. Even in the middle of these changes, you know what, the church might not look like this. You know what I mean? It may not look like this two years from now, ten years from now, but you know what? It will be here because God still does what God has always done, which is to create and recreate and breathe new life, and we just have to show up and say yes. It might look different, but it's the same breath, the same Holy Spirit. Amen? Let's pray. God, we thank you for this Pentecost Sunday. We thank you for this moment when the disciples huddled in fear, trapped in anxiety, doubt, wondering what in the world is going to happen next, <sighs> that the Holy Spirit descended and burst in and, and people were moved. They were filled with new life and new breath and they didn't hold back. They brought it to everyone else. God, I pray that we would follow that same example. Even though we don't know what comes next, even though it'll probably look entirely different than anything we've experienced before, we know that your spirit moves and creates and recreates and provides new breath, new life, and we want to be a part of that. We want to help be a part of that right here in this valley and beyond. God, we just pray that we would be attuned and open to the opportunity when it comes, because it comes every single day. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, at this time, I think, uh, yay, Mia, Mia's got the offering plate. All right, Mia's gonna walk around with the offering plate. If you have a, uh, something to put in there, just raise your hand and she'll come by, or if you're joining us online, there's a couple ways that you can participate in the uh, giving of the, uh, uh, funding our ministries here in the Valley. So you can mail checks in. There's the addresses for either church. And uh, make sure you just note the um, exact address because one of them is a post office box. That's how it's got to get there. Or you can drop them off at the offices. You just call ahead and make sure somebody's there and available. You can give online. Both churches have a way to do this. So for Clarkson, it's the big green button over on the right-hand side. You just click that, and there's a way to give there. For the Lewiston Church, it's over on the right-hand side, in the contact us menu, you drop that down and there's a donate button. You just give that way. You can also download an app on your phone if you have smartphones. So for Clarkson, it's the Tithely app, T-I-T-H-E dot L-Y. Download that on your phone and search for Clarkson UMC. Or for Lewiston, it's the Vanco Mobile Giving app. When you put that on your phone, search for the First United Methodist Church and then use the one in Lewiston, Idaho. Now, this month, our extra giving focus, if you have a little extra you want to give beyond the church, I recommend the, this month the Family Promise, uh, Lewis Clark Valley Family Promise. They do an incredible work helping folks transition into more permanent housing solutions. And also they do some pretty cool stuff like uh, they have diaper, uh, a diaper bank that, and they supply quite a bit of diapers for people, way beyond what other places give when they give out diapers. And so... Um, that's always an area they always need help with. Di if you don't have money but you got a bunch of diapers for whatever reason, you can give them those diapers or go buy some. Um, they also use, uh, could always use um, home n um, uh, utensils, cooking utensils and things like that for apartments and for the homes that they uh, move people into. All right. Apart from that, thank you so much for your generosity and your giving that allows us to be in ministry here in the, value and we th in the valley, and we thank you so much. Let me say a prayer for the offering, and then we'll move to our closing hymn. God, we thank you so much for this offering. We pray a blessing upon it. 
We pray that we as a congregation, as a body, that we would be moved by the Holy Spirit to use these resources to connect with others, to help encourage other people, to build up that relationship with other people and share the Holy Spirit together. We love you, God, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, our closing hymn. Uh, The words are on the screen, but it's also in the hymnal, hymn number 393, uh, Spirit of the Living God. If you're following along in the hymnal, we'll be doing it two times, two times through. Please stand. Thank you. You may be seated. Just a few announcements real quick before we move to our benediction. So first of all, I have been tasked with taking a poll. Or do you want to do the poll, Billy? Okay, Billy has a poll for you. Two, two of them. <laughs> yep, there you go. <laughs> well, good luck. Okay, we have the tables angled right now in the fellowship hall. The one poll is to tell us if you like the way they're angled or if you want to go back to having them straight facing the screen. No name, just a little hash mark is all we need. The other one is the company we got our coffee from has gone out of business. Hmm. So right now we're using Folgers for the regular coffee and Kirkland for the decaf. If you have something else you'd rather us use, put your suggestion down again, not your name, just the brand or whatever. And if we get enough that goes that way, we will try to accommodate. All right. Okay? And they're just inside the fellowship hall. Okay. Thank you. So log your responses there, and uh, that way Billy can make some plans. All right. Now, other announcements. Uh, Just a reminder, on Fridays at 9.30 a.m., we have in our fellowship hall a time we call coffee and contemplation, gather together for some conversation and talk about different topics. This Friday, the topic's going to be? Truth in the Bible. All right. Which goes nicely with our book study that follows the coffee and contemplation at 11. So the book is called, that's the next slide, The book is called Asking Better Questions of the Bible, A Guide for the Wounded, Wary, and Longing for More by Marty Solomon, and it's at 11 a.m., and uh, we're just really getting started. Uh, We had a couple weeks of it, but the chapters are small enough you could catch up real easy. So, like, those are the first three and a half or maybe even four chapters right there. So, very easy to get this and catch up with us. Uh, We'll be talking about at least try to get through chapter four, and join us for a discussion on that. Really good stuff. And is that it? Okay. What, any other announcements we need to know about? Anything going on? Okay, a pause. A pause on the Sunday school uh, at, um, for the summer. Oh, yes, this is important. Sunday, June 11th. So not next Sunday, but the following Sunday. 
we are gathering together with six other churches in the park, Foster Park in Clarkston, and uh, it's at 10.30, so please mark that on your calendar. Don't show up here at 11.15, and you'll be leading worship here on your own, uh, okay? You, you, you can do it, but join us. So Foster Park is on Diagonal Street, right next to all the, the churches. It's the churches we're meeting, right there in the, <laughs> the park. Um, Diagonal and, I'm not sure what the cr- cross street is, but right there, by, right by First Christian Church. And uh, what's the other churches? The Presbyterian Church, Church of God, the Wesley. Yes, well, the Wesleyan's a little bit further down, but yeah, all right there. So six, total of seven churches will be there uh, worshiping together, 10.30 a.m., and there will be a meal afterwards, a potato bar. If you want to, you can bring sides, you can bring a dessert, uh, toppings for the uh, potatoes, uh, but the main thing is just be there and show up, all right, at 10.30 a.m. Y- uh, there will be some chairs, but it would not be a bad idea to bring kind of a camping, you know, type style chair if you want. But they're one of the churches right there are providing, is providing, yes, one of the churches is providing uh, chairs to, to sit out there. And um, what's the other thing? Uh, I saw one other thing. Oh, yes, this Saturday... The Orchards UMC, they have a monthly men's breakfast, and it's at 9 a.m. It's this Saturday coming up. This one will be at um, Main Street Grill, so we could use a RSVP if you want to get there for that. So let me know if you plan on going. I'll make sure to tell the Orchards Church and let them know this is how many people are coming, all right? So Saturday, 9 a.m., Main Street Grill. Just let me know, and I'll pass it on. I think that's it for announcements. Okay, let me send you off with a benediction. I think it's up there, yes. As you have blessed this gathering, bless us as we share our gifts. Bless us to be one body. Bless us to be one holy church. Yeah, man. Peace be with you.